Heartfelt thanks to Rick Doblin, Amanda Fielding, David Nichols, and Bob Jesse, the hosts of this promising conference for their invitation to give us uh, the chance to uh, present, present uh, the life of Albert Hoffman and the, his discovery of LSD. And based on our book, Mystic Chemist, launched today, and for which we thank Deborah Parrish Snyder and her publishing team at Synergetic Press. As Rick already mentioned, Lucius and I arranged the international symposium LSD, Problem Child, and Wonder Drug in Basel at the occasion of Albert Hoffman's 100th birthday. And today we celebrate the 17th anniversary when he experienced the extraordinary effects of his discovery which changed his life and millions of others. Hardly any other discovery in the 20th century has exercised greater influence on science, society, and culture than the mysterious, incredibly potent substance that already in doses of micrograms profoundly alters consciousness. So from 19th April 1943 on, our biography of Albert Hoffman is interwoven with a detailed overview of all aspects of his fateful discovery. In our short talk, however, we will primarily focus on a few crucial moments and events in the long life of the mystic chemist. Early in the 20th century, Switzerland changed from agricultural to industrial economy. The first rail line ran between Zurich and nearby Baden, at that time still known for its spas. Brown Boveri Limited, BBC for short, two days ABB, was founded in the small town. The market leader for steam turbines, generators, and electric locomotives soon became the largest company of the country. On 11th January 1906, Albert Hoffman was born in Baden, much to the joy of his German-born father, Adolf, and his mother, Elizabeth. And that's the first picture of Albert Hoffman. And here are the parents, the proud parents. And they had met while working for a subsidiary of BBC in a suburb of Basel. He as a metal worker, she as a secretary. But soon after, he was transferred to the company's main factory in Baden. His wages were low, and the circumstances of the growing family, of the growing working class family, was rather modest. Albert's brother was born in 1908. Two sisters followed, one brother died right after birth, one sister at age two. Here we see Albert on the left and his brother sitting. Albert didn't recall details about his family's small apartment, but remembered the lively household of which his mother was the center. He saw his father less often. He went to bed early in the evening and got up early in the next morning, six days a, a week. On Sunday afternoons, 
the head of the family, joined his colleagues at the regular's table in the local tavern. But from his earliest years on, Albert was fascinated by nature and blessed with a downright curiosity. And one day when he was four, a crowd gathered in the street looking up into the sky. And Albert saw Halley's Comet. 76 years later, he would see the comet pass again and remember his childhood in Baden. And looking back at his 100th birthday, he commented that the constellation of the comets or whatever governs human fate must have been pointing to luck. A year later, the family moved to a new place on a hill above town. For Albert, that was paradise. Across the street was a Wainwright, a farrier, and a farm, and he quickly found new friends to play and explore the area as often as possible. The ruins of the nearby castle made a perfect playground, and he remembers his mother calling from the kitchen window when they lost track of time up there. In September 1912, Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II made a state visit to Switzerland. And later, Albert Hoffmann often spoke of having spotted the emperor when his train stopped at the Baden train station. At his 95th birthday party, one of his childhood schoolmates expressed doubt. He couldn't see and catch a glimpse of the emperor. And slyly, Hoffman explained, well, that's because you're always standing on the wrong side of the train. I saw and recognized him, and in fact, he even waved at me. I mean, already in his youth, he was at the right place at the right time. Here it's Albert with his first bicycle. <laughs> One day he was fascinated to see for the first time an automobile as it clattered noisily through the narrow streets of Baden's old town. <laughs> At a friend's house, he experimented the advent of radio and telephone where he heard the voice of a person who wasn't there. And two years later, as he rode along with the neighboring farmers on their hay wagon to the fields above the town, they heard cannon fire from the distance France. World War I had begun. But despite the distant battlefields, those years on the hillside were happy ones for Albert. Nothing pleased him more to wander through the fields, the meadows, and the nearby forest, alone or with his pals. He savored the sentiment of total freedom. Here we see this, the, uh, the castle above the town and that specific forest. And one sunny morning in May, at age 10, when he again strolled through the forest, he experienced a spontaneous, mystical vision of all-encompassing unity. He heard the birds sing more clearly, the fresh green of the trees and the sparkling of sun rays through the leaves seemed more intense. Everything appeared in bright light. He was filled with bliss and sensing absolute emotional security. And Albert wasn't sure if he could report these marvels to grown-ups since he had never heard them speak of such things. And already then he, he began to reflect upon the nature and of the material world and wondered if as an adult he would still be able to have a similar experience 
and communicate them to others. And later he stated, it was these experiences that shaped the main outlines of my worldview and convinced me of the existence of a miraculous reality that was hidden from everyday sight. It was unexpected, but hardly accidentally, that in midlife, my professional activity converged with the visionary intuition of my boyhood. Now, already for some time, Albert's father was suffering from tuberculosis. And finally, even the short trip from the hillside Thomas Hill to his workplace was too difficult for him. And the family needed to move to a house directly at the factory entrance. For Albert, this meant expulsion from paradise. But whenever school, homework, or household duties permitted it, he fled the drab factory quarter, hurried up into nature, and to the forest, which became so meaningful to him. At age 12, Albert finished elementary school, and with his native inquisitiveness and thirst for knowledge, and since learning was a sheer pleasure for him, he yearned to transfer to high school, which would allow him to attend university. But with his seriously ill father and the weak economic outlook, his parents decided that he should go out on his own as soon as possible and be, be, be prepared to contribute to the family's maintenance when conditions required. With very little enthusiasm, Albert began a commercial apprenticeship with BBC, his father's employer. Oh, yes, okay, <laughs> it works, <laughs> thank you. Here we see him, the apprentice, and his school teacher, impressed by his attentive and diligent pupil, convinced of his talent, was sad about the step forced to be taken. But consequently, he supplied him with textbooks for subjects in natural sciences, such as botany and Latin, necessary for the high school diploma. What a luck. Albert dedicated on the other side whatever free time remained to learning. And that means after or before or after a nine hour day um, as an apprentice. And after three years, he completed his apprenticeship but for, for financial reasons, continued working at BBC. So that's a normal, that was the secretary's office of the BBC at that time. And then on Palm Sunday, 1922, Albert was confirmed and entered the world of adults. Here we see him on one of his strolls through nature on a mountain. But his stint as a business clerk did not last long. His extremely sympathetic godfather had also noticed his godson's considerable talent and his consistent ambition for greater things. And he surprised him one day with the news to pay him a private school in Zurich. And Albert Hoffman remembers I soaked up the subject material like a sponge. And after just a year, passed the federal high school diploma, which was known for its difficulty. And Hoffman also had a creative vein, took evening classes in drawing, sculpture, painting, 
and for a while even considered studies in humanities, the arts, or in architecture. But inspired and moved by the memories of his mystical experience in the forest, he felt compelled to uncover the nature and structure of living matter. What lay beyond his visionary insights into the material world. So in the spring of 1925, Albert Hoffman began studying organic chemistry at the University of Zurich under the renowned Nobel Prize winner, Professor Paul Carrer. Here is Albert Hoffman on the roof of the University of Zurich and here with his student friends. <laughs> he completed his studies in the shortest time possible. During Christmas 1928, he finished his doctoral thesis on the structural clarification and enzymatic decomposition of chitin and chitosan. And Paul Carr praised the highly regarded dissertation as a work of distinction. After only eight semesters at the age of 23, Hoffman received his doctorate in the spring of 1929. But three months before finishing his studies, his father died. Albert in the middle, Walter on the left, and a friend. And that's the mourning family after the father passed away. But the eldest son was still able to, tem to tell his father that he had agreed to take a position with Sandoz, a chemical company in Basel. Basel is located at the end of the Rhine Valley, where Germany, France, and Switzerland meet. In the 16th century, Paracelsus became the city, the city physician and lectured at the university. From him, we know the legendary saying, dosis, sola dosis facit venenum, in English, the dose makes the poison. Carl Jung was professor for medicine at the university in the mid 19th century and later Friedrich Nietzsche was appointed professor of philosophy. And around the same time, the Hesse, Hermann Hesse and his family settled in Basel. And then on the 1st of May, 1929, Albert Hoffman began his work at Sandoz. That's the factory ground at that time. A lot of smoke, also in real, which means quite a functioning production at that time. That's inside the Sandal Laboratories. Decisive for him was the opportunity to work in the Department for Pharmaceutical Research founded by Arthur Stoll on the chemistry of natural products and the makeup of medicinal plants. Until 1935, Hoffman focused on squill and foxglove alkaloid research. And finally then he got his own lab <clears throat> before three chemists with working in three different fields were sharing one lab. And finally, here we see Albert Hoffman in his own lab. <clears throat> <coughs> and that's the building where the lab was.
but Albert Hoffman was also training his body and not only his mind. That's bodybuilding. And he continued his fitness training in Basel with swimming and running, was a member of the academic athletic club and exercised at the boxing club. And finally, in the winter of 1934, Hoffman and a friend went for a winter vacation to, a, to Arosa in south, southeastern Switzerland for skiing. On Saturday night, a popular masked ball was held in the resort's entertainment hall. Near the end of the ball, a prize was awarded the woman with the best disguise and the prettiest costume. And that evening, the winner was a certain Anita Guanella. And when the gracious young woman removed her mask, Albert Hoffman felt hopeless, hopelessly in love. And knew at once, she is going to be my wife. For her, it was love at first sight because they met immediately after he saw her. And as quickly as they had met, they decided to marry. And here is Anita on ice, setting up for a pirouette, follow a, followed by a safe landing. And already in May 1935, they, the wedding took place in Lucerne, and here's the happy couple. On their honeymoon, the newlyweds traveled to Munich, Vienna, and off and on to Hungary's capital, Budapest. Still Budapest. And Albert Hoffman marked the new chapter in his life by burning all the diaries from his bachelor days. Now Basel was his workplace and soon the town became the living place for the happy couple. Nine months after, her mar after their marriage, their son Dieter arrived, son Andreas followed, and then the daughters Gabi and Beatrix. On 1st September 1939, World War II began. Switzerland called for a general mobilization. And like any other healthy Swiss, Lieutenant Albert Hoffman did his duty in the militia. He was stationed in the canton of Ticino in the, Chino in the south of Switzerland and in his words to defend the southern border against Mussolini. And midway through the war, here we see him with his company and here in a maneuver and midway through the war in May 1941, the family moved into a larger house in the, in the still rural village near Basel, where they lived for the next 27 years. It's Albert Hoffman with the two sons. It's the two sons. Rural scenery. It's the family in the garden. It's the first daughter. And Hoffman began to work more during his free time in his retreat, as he called his home office. He could prepare lectures, write articles, complete lab journals, and correspond with researchers from around the world. Outside Switzerland, war still raged. A diary entry highlighted the nearest of the war. In November 1944, he wrote, now, French soldiers again patrol along the border under my laboratory window, just as they did before 1940. And during the war, gasoline was rationed and only a few very wealthy people could afford a car anyway. That's the main street in the... Uh, Labor in the Sanders factory at that time. But Hoffman managed the longer distance to work by bicycle, bicycle as he did before. His superior, Arthur Stoll, began investigating ergot, 
and in 1935 agreed that Albert Hoffman resume his research. The ergot was grown by farmers in the Emmental region, more or less in the center of Switzerland, and shipped to Sandoz in Basel for further processing. What we have seen here is the inoculating of the, of the rye, of the, yes, of the rye to produce ergot fungus. And that's the harvest, and that's the shipping in huge sacks to Basel. Hoffman's method of synthesis became the generally recognized basis for producing related structures from the original ergot alkaloid. He subsequently produced a number of lysergic acid derivatives, among them the 25th lysergic acid diethylamide on 16th November 1938, hence the designation LSD-25. He hoped that it would be a new cardiovascular stimulant. But because the effects observed during animal testings were less than expected, Sandoz immediately lost interest. But the substance didn't pass into oblivion. Hoffman could not stop thinking about it. And he mentioned, I had a strange premonition that this drug might have additional effects to those exhibited during the first trial. This led me to produce LSD-25 five years later after the first synthesis. This was unusual because test compounds were normally struck from the research program once declared to be of no pharmacological interest. And later Hoffman could, not, could neither find a, res, a rational explanation for his hunch nor reconstruct why it was that he chose to resume, to resurrect that particular compound out of the many he had created. And he said, or he mentioned, it was more a feeling, the chemical structure appealed to me that prompted me to take that extraordinary step. He scheduled the second synthesis for 16th April 1943, and to, to his surprise, he had to interrupt his work in the middle of the afternoon and went home being affected by restlessness combined with a slight dizziness. The intoxication was rather pleasant, a dreamlike state with increased imagination and the intense kaleidoscopic play of colors. And after only some two hours, this condition faded away. And although Hoffman was sure to have worked with greatest caution, as always, traces of the substance must have caused the mild intoxication through a finger or somehow it came into his body. But now he had to know and decided to undertake a self-experiment the following 19th April. And he chose, in his opinion, an extremely low dosage of only 250 micrograms, a dose of which he thought could only have a slight effect. But an hour after ingestion, the effects again started with dizziness, disturbed vision, paralysis, and soon turned to anxiety and led to a severe crisis. In panic, he cycled home and this time asked his assistant, Susie Rumstein, to accompany him. His experiment with LSD-25 was an eight-hour-long blend of horror and bliss, beginning with fear of death, but finally ending with a feeling of being reborn after 
a good sleep the other day, the other morning. Albert Hoffman has discovered the most potent psychoactive substance yet known. He described the first LSD trip in history in all details in his book, LSD, My Problem Child, well known and quoted over and over. And the book is now available, available again as a MAPS publication, by the way. But noticeable is that his experience immediately turned into a pleasant and enjoyable one as soon as his family doctor told him after check his, checking his condition at home that he need not fear he was on the threshold of death nor permanent damage from poisoning. And Hoffman later regarded this sudden mental change as the first hint for the future set and setting concept which became so important for guided or for any psychedelic sessions. And by the way, his team assistant at Sandoz was the first woman to have an LSD experience in June 1943, she at an age of 22, because it was um, everybody was so surprised that he had uh, this enormous effects and uh, nobody believed him and so his team uh, decided to undertake self-experiments as well and including his assistant, although with a lower dosage of 100 micrograms. And since 1984, the 19th of April has been celebrated as Bicycle Day, initiated by colleague and friend Thomas B. Roberts. Thank you. And now more from Lucius. Shall I? I'm just going to introduce Lucius briefly. Um, Lucius Worth Miller, uh, sorry, is um, a consciousness researcher and, and a parapsychologist. Uh, Lucius is founding board member of the Gaia Media Foundation, that's GaiaMedia.org. He was project manager of the International Symposium, LSD Problem Child and Wonder Drug, in January 2006, and on the, on the occasion of the 100th birthday of Albert Hoffman in Basel, and of the World Psychedelic Forum held in 2008. Meeting Albert Hoffman when he was a child, Lucius remained close to him until the end of his life. Together with Dieter Hagenbach, he is co-author of Albert Hoffman and his LSD, An Eventful Life and Significant Discovery. Lucius. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's really an honor and a pleasure to talk to you about our friend Albert Hoffman. I met, as he just mentioned, Albert as a child and stayed connected with him through, uh, throughout his life. And as time is very limited, I concentrate on his life, his personality, and his work, and not on the impact of his most significant discovery, which has been crucial, especially here in the Bay Area in the 1960s, as you can see here on this picture. For the direct flight from Zurich to San Francisco, Swiss Airlines decorated an Airbus in the style of the hippie generation and used the song, If You're Going to San Francisco, in the radio ads. Gordon Wasson and Alan Richardson were most likely the first white men to eat the sacred mushroom in a traditional ceremony with the curandera uh, Maria Sabina in June 1955. Albert Hoffman first learned of Mexico's magic mushrooms in 1956 from a newspaper. He was intrigued to analyze them chemically. The same year, the Wassons and French researcher Roger Heim investigated the mushrooms in Oaxaca, and Heim sent samples to several labs in Europe and the US. As there were no results, Heim turned to Sando, and during a visit in Basel, handed Hoffman the mushrooms he had cultivated. Hoffman noted, hence, LSD attracted the mushrooms into my lab. He began Immediately, the extraction experiments with 100 grams of psilocybe mexicana heim. 
Since tests on animals showed no particular effects, Hoffman decided on a self-experiment with 30 dried mushrooms having a total weight of 2.4 grams. And as he had done before, he carried out the self-experiment at his working place. Hoffman noted in his journal, after half an hour, the external world became unfamiliar. Whether my eyes open or closed, I only saw Indian motifs and colors. Further, self-experiments were the only way to, of determining the effective fraction. Hoffman's colleagues in the psychedelic lab participated in the experiments. By the beginning of 1958, Hoffman had succeeded in isolating the active agent and conducted the first experiment with the effective fraction. He named the new substance psilocybin and the second one psilocin. His work established a milestone in the medical chemistry of indole structures. From then on, Sando assumed a leading role in indole chemistry. All the more motivated now, Hoffman turned to another magical Mexican drug, the seed of a member of the Morning Glory family. That's what's known by its Aztec name, Ololiuki. The major agent found was lysergic acid amid. Almost as a matter of routine, Hoffman decided on a further self-experiment and described the state as dreamlike and characterized by the unreality and senselessness of the external world. And Albert Hoffman afterwards wrote, these experiments with Ololiuki rounded off my work in the area of hallucinogenic drugs. They formed a circle, you could say a magic circle. It began with the production of lysergic acid emits from ergobacin. They led to synthesis of LSD. The work with LSD led to experiments with the magic mushroom from which psilocybin and psilocin were isolated. The study with the mushroom led to a second magi Mexican magical drug, Ololiuki. In Ololiuki, we again found as hallucinogenic agents lysergic acid emits, among them ergobacin, which closed the magic circle. Meanwhile, his exchange with Gordon Wasson had deepened and their friendship had grown. Wasson asked Hoffman to join him on an expedition to Mexico in September 1962. You see Albert uh, on the right. Highlight of that journey was a ceremony Maria Sabina conducted with Hoffman's psilocybin pills. She confirmed that his pills did contain the spirit of Theonana Kattel. And Hoffman remembered that was confirmation from an expert that synthetic psilocybin was identical to the natural product. In parting, I presented her with a small bottle of psilocybin pills and she radi radiantly explained that now she could give consultations even when no mushrooms were growing. Hoffman worked 20, uh, 42 years for Sando. In 1952, he became director of research. In 59, he was named deputy managing director. Although more occupied with management concerns, he still worked in the lab as often as possible. He published around 150 articles in professional journals. His chief scientific work is the monograph, The Ergot Alkaloids. Hoffman's research brought several drugs with sales in the billions. One was methogen for controlling bleeding after onset of delivery. And as he put it, methogen is an aid during physical birth while LSD is a, an aid during spiritual birth or rebirth. Other medicines were dihydrogot, promocryptine, and hydrogen, which in the 1970s 
was Sando's most lucrative drug with annual sales of up to 600 million Swiss francs. Under the brand name Delicide, Sando produced LSD from 1947 to 1966. Under the brand name Indosibin, the manufactured psilocybin uh, was available. And about his discoveries, he modestly said, of course, I was able to fish when the pond was still full. Today, research in large enterprises is extremely focused and targeted. The freedom that Hoffman enjoyed in his work is immense and now, nowadays difficult to imagine. He chose his areas of investigation himself, corresponded with colleagues from other companies about ongoing projects, on his own initiative pursued pot potentially interesting substances, and in his self-experiments he was a also able to involve his co-workers without any restriction. And for his discoveries and research, he received numerous honors and awards. He was named a member of the World Academy of Art and Science and received three honorary doctorates, the first one from the Royal Pharmaceutical Institute of Sweden in Stockholm. That's where this picture comes from, from the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich and by the Free University of Berlin and he is probably the best-known chemist of the 20th century. 1971, he retired at age 65, and he looked forward to the next stage of his life and wrote to Humphrey Osmond, chemistry is replaced by occupation with philosophy, poetry, and fine arts, and he was in top mental and physical form. Meanwhile, the Hoffmans had built their own house in a small village of Burg near Basel. They both were happy with their parad paradise, as they called it. Hoffman wrote, On the Riti Mathe, my life has come full circle, also in the sense that I again found my childhood paradise, the same countryside where I was so blessed as a boy. That's the view from his house. And Albert repeatedly referred to Riti Mathe as my second biggest discovery. After his retirement, he began to write a story of his, uh, of his discovery. Work on the manuscript stretched over several years. And in the fall of 1979, his uh, most significant legacy, LSD, My Problem Child, appeared in German. And with his close friend, Richard Evans Schultes, founder of Ethnobotany, he co-authored two books. The Botany and Chemistry of Hallucinogens was published in 1973, and six years later, Plants of the Gods, intended for a wider audience, appeared and Schultes, he remained associated with Harvard University throughout his life. And during one of Hoffman's visits, Schultes obliged Albert to join in the commencement day festivities, wearing the traditional black and red robe of professors. For Hoffman, his appearance as a Harvard professor, you see him on the right, remained unforgettable but also classical Greece was really a lifelong source of inspiration for Albert to the extent that he sometimes wondered if his admir admiration originated from a past life experienced in that era. He was particularly fascinated by the legendary mysteries of Eloises. Gordon Wasson, Albert Hoffman, and Karl Ruck 
devoted themselves to the mystery and believed they found a solution. They saw in the ritual drink Kikon, an ergot potion closely related to a LSD, and they summarized their findings in the book The Road to Eloisis in 1978. And with his publisher Roger Lickensdorfer and the translator of his books into English, Jonathan Ott and other friends, Hoffman traveled to Eloisis in 2000 near Athens. And Lickensdorfer recalled the visit to Eloisis was like a homecoming for Hoffman. He felt a strong connection. I have never before or since seen him so withdrawn into himself. His last book, Inside Outlook, was published by Alberts and my friend Dieter in the Sphinx Verlag in the fall of 86. And to Albert, this book contained the core of my philosophy of life. Albert had countless friends, among them artists of, and writers like Aldous Huxley or the German Ernst Jünger, here with Anita and Albert. He and Timothy Leary first met in person on the Lake Geneva two months after Hoffman had retired. Soon after their meeting, Leary was arrested by the Swiss police. One month later, Leary was freed after Switzerland rejected the U.S. request for extradition. And Hoffman, he expressed his delight. Dear Timothy, returning from a trip to Stockholm, I learned about the decision of our authorities that you will not be extradited to the USA. What a relief! I am confident that Dr. Mastronardi will be successful in getting a permission for you to stay in Switzerland. Are you now free to travel in our country wherever you like so that we can plan a visit to the Riti Mate? All my best wishes for you and Rosemary in the new year and kindest regards. Cordially, Albert. One month later, during the legendary carnival in Basel, the two met again. In July 1993, they met last time in Hamburg for a television program marking the 50th anniversary of LSD, and they renewed their friendship. Gordon Bosson also visited the Hoffmans often. He stayed up to three weeks and shuffled around in the, the house in large slipper, as Albert's son Andreas recalls. Our regular guests were Richard and his wife Dorothy Schultes. Many artists, scientists and experts also came for a visit to the Riti Mate. Among them William Burroughs. You see him here on the right, on the left, Gordon Boston and Albert Hoffman. Or Stan and Christina Groff. John C. Lilly. Ralph Metzner, David Nichols, Rick Doblin. You see him here, a young Rick Doblin, 1983 at the meeting in Davos, Switzerland, when they first met. But also Amanda Fielding or Alex Gray and others like Stanley Krippner, Jonathan Ott, Andrew Sewell, and especially Anne and Alexander Shulgin, the other father of psychedelics. Franz Vollenweider and many others. And from all over the world, many people came unannounced to, to see the father of LSD. And quite a few, few of these uninvited guests were met at the door by Hoffman himself, who asked them into the house. And Hoffman ref uh, remarked about this afterwards. Whenever it was possible, I received these visitors. I considered it a responsibility that came with my role in the history of LSD, and I have attempted to be a source of information and advice. Albert Hoffman, he had two sides to his personality. He was a border crosser, intellectually, between science and mysticism, in attitudes, 
between conventionality and nonconformity. Inwardly, Albert remains socially conservative. From childhood on, he was extremely disciplined and he did not appreciate it when guests dressed sloppily or spoke crudely. But on the other hand, he was really open. He liked to travel and to explore other countries and cultures. And he made sketches in his travel diaries. Here you see a few pictures. And he also liked to meet interesting people. Unconventional people's high regard of his persons and of his person and his contacts with many artists led him to be increasingly more tolerant. He was naturally open towards new acquaintances, and in his later years he began to enjoy his excursions into the psychedelic culture. So at the Psychoactivity Conference in Amsterdam, 1998, Hoffman, at the age of 92, enjoyed dancing with young women at the conference's techno party until three in the morning. And he carried out countless tests with many different lysergic acid derivatives, with magic mushrooms, with salvia divinorum, and with amanita muscaria. About MDMA, he wrote to Ralph Metzner that, Anita would like it. In later years, with close friends who are present here at the conference, he smoked a strongly psychoactive 5 meo DMT. And at the age of 95, he visited a Goa party near the Ritimate and relaxed. He sat down, took a few whiffs from the circling joints and signed some LSD blotters. To him, his LSD was precious and unique. And he was really shocked when he heard of the existence of LSD prisoners. And he wrote to John Beresford, I became deeply moved and terrified when I learned that people were sentenced to decades of imprisonment for possession of LSDs. The stories of victims you report seem incredible to happen in a civilized society very shocking. What kind of administration is that which com commits such criminal acts? And he also met producers of illegal LSD like Stanley Owsley or Nick Sands and he was impressed with their chemical skills. Here Nick Sand at a conference in Basel where he came to congratulate Albert to his 100th birthday. And into very advanced age, Albert occasionally experimented with low doses of LSD. He considered doses of about 20 micrograms to be mentally stimulating, a type of psych of vitamin and mood elevator. And in January 2006, Albert Hoffman turned 100. Dieter and I organized an official ceremony with prominent speakers and guests. Here, Albert with his friends, H.R. Giger and Stan Gruff. Who, and H.R. Giger, for those who don't know him, he won an Oscar for the creation of the alien. Swiss federal president Moritz Leuenberger congratulated him with a personal letter. And in Bottmingen, where he had lived over 25 years, the street was named after him. The citizens of Burg organized a big birthday party and donated him a bench on the Ritimate. The weekend after his birthday, we organized a big conference, LSD Problem Child and Wonder Drug, where he had interesting talks with him on the stage. At the closing ceremony, um, uh, where he was celebrated like a rock star. He said, now my problem child is definitely a wonder child. But it was also an exhausting time for him. Whenever he was tired, he used to say, 
you know, I am not 90 anymore. <laughs> Two years later, on Easter 2008, we organized a follow-up event, the World Psychedelic Forum. It attracted some 2,000 participants each day from 37 countries. And a special promise for the future was the rising researchers' lectures, coordinated by Thomas B. Roberts, with more than 30 young researchers reporting on their work, among them Bia Labate, who has been speaking in the opening session. Albert Hoffman had to cancel his appearance due to health issues. His grandson Simon re read Albert's message to, of greeting to all. And a number of speakers visited Albert at his home, among them Stan Groff, and Caroline Garcia. <laughs> you see here Caroline Garcia, former member of the Merry Pranksters, who presented him with an acid test certificate. His wife, Anita, she was responsible for the household and for cohesion of the family. And she accepted the tra traditional woman's role and put her own needs last. Anita was a perfect hostess, and even in her advanced years, she encouraged guests to stay for dinner. She was a plant lover with a green thumb, with friends like my mom, Heidi. She talked about gardening. They exchanged tips, seeds, and seedlings. And in her last years, Anita suffered constantly from pain without saying much. She died in December 2007 at the age of 94 in the presence of her husband. It was a wrenching loss for, for uh, uh, Albert, uh, to whom she was married for almost 75 years. Their grandson Simon recalls moments when he sat in her room and seemed extremely sad. He did not wish to show his pain and grief, but he knew that Soon I will go too and see Anita again. On the morning of April 29, 2008, Albert Hoffman died at the age of 102 in his house on the Riti Matte. This is the desk on the morning of his death, with the diary in which he made entries nearly every day still open. Three days earlier, a musician offered a harp concert in his home. The evening before his death, his grandson Simon talked to him on the phone, and nothing indicated that the end was coming. Simon re remembered he was in good spirits and wanted to organize another house concert. Since Anita's death, the caregiver Hedy Brodbeck and Al Albert Hoffman often ate dinner together. On the night before his death, he hardly wanted her to, l to let her leave. The next morning, he called her and said, I'm so cold, I have to die now. One hour later, around half past eight, he died in my arms with a smile on his face, she remembered. Albert Hoffman had never feared death. And due to my profession as a parapsychologist, we often discussed the question of survival. And he would say, I don't believe in a life after death. And after a dramatic pause added, I know there is life after death. In his last interview, one week before his death, he confirmed his opinions. LSD no longer is a problem child. I am proud of this wonder drug that opens the doors of perception. LSD has brought happiness to many people. I don't think that I need LSD to die. I can face death with joy. To the final question of, on the meaning of life, he replied, to rejoice over creation. The beauty of creation is the best drug in the world. 
and he sent the reporter off with the question, do you hear the silence? Albert Hoffman was survived by his children Andreas and Beatrix, ten grandchildren and as many great-grandchildren. At the funeral service, the chapel was full. Many relatives, friends, colleagues from work were, were among the mourners and Rick Doblin as the only guest from the US. Here you see him after the funeral in conversation with Peter Gasser, who conducted in Switzerland the first study on LSD after many years. Their children, Andreas and Beatrice, planted two trees on the Ritimate and buried their parents' ashes beneath them. Dieter and I visited Albert a few days before his death, reporting on the World Psychedelic Forum and brought him greetings for many presenters and visitors. And so often, as so often before, he led us around the house and rejoiced over the fresh spring green. Until his last breath, he was living full of joy, vital energy, and with an alert mind. Even though Albert Hoffman is no longer with us, his LSD will never vanish from our world. Of this, its discoverer was certain. We share his hope that and wish that LSD will once more be authorized for meaningful and safe use, that it may contribute to expanding human consciousness and making the world a better place. Many thanks for your attention. I'm sorry that we are a little bit over the time, but we also started late. And we will be available for questions in the lobby where we sign our book, Mystic Chemist, Chemist, which is launched today at the 70th anniversary of his, uh, the discovery of LSD. And many thanks to Deborah Paris Snyder and all the people involved in the project for the huge efforts to make it available in English in such a limited time. And also thanks to Stanislav Grof for his wonderful foreword. And we wish him good recovery. And thank you for attention. Thank you.